welcome back to another episode of the Authors Unite show. Today we got Mike Rhodes. So welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, man. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Grateful to have you here. If you can, um, just start us off with a little introduction, who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, I'm here in Melbourne, Australia. I've been running a digital agency here for 15, 16 years. So deep into the Google Ads side of things, we now do Facebook ads and a bunch of other things for clients. Clients are all over the world, mostly Australia and the US. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to, my first question to you is selfish. Okay. <laughs> because I just hired a team for Google ads. So <laughs> tell me, I know you have the ultimate guide to Google ads and I checked it out and it looks like it's a pretty, pretty long book potentially. <laughs> um, so if you were to kind of and I know actually over 130,000 copies sold. So because this is the Authors Unite show, let me first congratulate you on that. That's incredible. Uh, that's that's a lot of copies. Um, so I guess, how would you, I don't know the right words, dumb it down, but summarize it. Like if somebody wanted to be successful okay. with Google ads, what would you, what would you say? Well, um, yeah, one, it is a long book because there is a lot of nuance to Google ads. It is very easy to get started which is how Google make maybe so much money if you're a cynic, um, but it's very hard to master. So there are lots of little gotchas in there. I won't say it's designed to make Google a lot of money, but there's a lot of ways you can get trapped where it looks like, oh, that, that looks like a sensible thing to do. We'll just do that. Mm, but why isn't it doing what I thought it was going to do? Or why is it showing ads in all these different places? So there's a lot of little nuance to it. So with that said, the way I typically describe it is picture a pyramid with three levels. Your bottom level is bidding. So there's bidding, targeting, and messaging, because what we're ultimately trying to do is show the right ad to the right person at the right time and do so profitably. And mm -hmm. there's three main levers that we have to do that inside of a Google Ads account. Bidding, and the reason I draw it as this pyramid is the robots are coming up from the bottom. So that's the fundamental stuff. That's the first bit that robots are at this point, basically better than humans at doing. It's basically a gigantic math problem. Robots are pretty good at that. When I say robots, software, computers, machine learning, kind of all the same thing. Then our middle layer is targeting. Who are we going to show ads to? So right now, Google is incredibly powerful at that. There's two main ways that we do that, either based on keywords, so what people are typing into Google. That's mainly going to result in a search or a shopping ad. Oh, let me, let me come back to ads. Um, basically keywords or audiences, audiences of people that have behaved in similar ways. And that might be behaved in similar ways on, on your site, people that have added a product to a cart, but not bought yet. There's a whole group of people that have done that in the past few days. Hey, Google, go show an ad to those people. Or mm -hmm. here's my email list of 50,000 people. Go show an ad to these people. You know who they are, you know where they are, follow them around and show them this ad. So we've got bidding and targeting. Targeting kind of 50-50 at this point between the, the humans and the machines. The machines are pretty good at it, but a human can add little tweaks and nuance that make that better. Mm -hmm. and the last little bit, the top of our pyramid is messaging. What ad do you actually want to show? And this is where humans, for now at least, have the edge, you have persuasive copy, testing different offers, thinking about the ad that someone needs to see if they're at that part of their journey and then obviously which page of the website do we take them to what offer do we show them so bidding computers have pretty much won that one targeting 50 50 messaging a little bit more on the human side those three things are the main things you want to worry about and then of course the whole thing is wrapped in data what gotcha. data do we want to collect how do we know it's working what is our measure of success what data do we feed back to the machine so it does a better job of doing all of those things. That's good. Got idea. Idea. Okay, got it. So it really comes down to like, well, I guess for, for the listeners, is there any, um, is there any like budget that you'd say minimum you want to start with? Because it seems to me then it's kind of like uh, testing, right? So you'd start out with what you think is best. And yep. then based on some data over the next couple of weeks of that spend, then you would you know, look at it and then change accordingly, I, I suppose. Exactly. We are buying data or data and 
the data we collect is what helps us optimize. So, you know, it's time or money, maybe both. You, if you spend more per day, you're going to get more data and you can optimize faster. If you spend a little bit per day, less risk, but it's going to take you longer to optimize. So how much should you spend it? There are so many variables in that. It depends on so yeah. many things. You can get an idea because there's, there's, there's also four main parts to Google Ads. I think when we say Google Ads, a lot of people will hear those little text ads at the top of the page on Google. But there are also shopping ads, those little square images with the price and description underneath. If you're a retailer, I would mm. urge you to try running Google Shopping ads. A lot of retailers I meet are only running Facebook ads or, or possibly only running Amazon ads. But there are so many people searching Google every day for the products that you oh. sell. Are those the ones just to make sure I'm understanding? So say of, um, cause I, I think I looked up like Stairmaster cause I'm thinking of buying a, a Stairmaster soon. Yeah. And then the top, it actually was like little boxes up top that came up and those were ads actually. They're all ads. Oh, yeah. okay. Got it, got it. Sometimes you see those little pictures down the right hand side, but yeah, those little square images, they've generally got the price, maybe a title or a little bit of a description underneath it and the business name. So those are shopping ads. Super profitable. Uh, at least half of our clients are e-commerce these days. We used to be predominantly lead gen. Now it's kind of half half. Got Those it. make a lot of money for advertisers and therefore for Google. So Google love them. So Google are showing those ads in more and more places, including in your Gmail account or on YouTube. So you might watch a video and see some of those little product ads, some of those little shopping ads next to the video you're watching or, or underneath the video if you're on a mobile device. So Got Google loves those and they love them because consumers love them. Because when you click that, so you search for Stairmaster, if you click one of those, you've seen the product, you've seen the price that that particular retailer has it for. So you've got that much more context before you click. And so they're more likely to convert. So they're good for advertisers, they're good for users. They know what they're getting before they click compared to a text ad that, well, I think I'm going in the right place, but I'm not quite sure. For sure. So shopping, they're all powered by keywords. So that's what you're gonna see when you go to google.com and you do a search. They're the two types of ads you're gonna see there. But there's this whole other half of network uh, of, of Google called the display network. So this is some Google properties like those ones I've mentioned, YouTube, Gmail, Google Maps, where Google have all this inventory that they would love to make some money from. You know, a billion people a month logging into YouTube, they wanna make some money from those little videos that pop up before the video that you're trying to watch. And those really annoying mid-roll videos that show <laughs> yeah, occasionally a... down the right-hand side of YouTube. There's some of those are ads as well. But Google's view on this is an ad, a good ad, is information. Uh, Larry and Sergey never wanted to get into the ad business. They had to be convinced that an ad could be useful information. Remember their mission is all about, you know, the world's information and making it useful. Well, an ad done right can be useful information. You know, if you see ads for things that you are interested in, that you haven't quite got around to buying yet, that can be useful. There's a lot of ads that are really annoying and that really is just a targeting problem. Mm -hmm. So as you're wandering around the web, so this display network contains over 2 million websites and over a million apps at this point. So basically they've all done a deal with Google to say, well, yeah, Buzzfeed, we've got loads of people coming to our website all the time. We'd like to make a little bit of money from that. So Google, um, you can have this corner of our website here and this bit down here. We'll put some code there and then you figure out in that moment when somebody arrives on my website, you figure out what's the best ad to show to that person based on all the stuff you know about them which is quite a lot. And then they'll think about everything that that person's been doing recently, what they've been searching for, which websites they've been going to, based on all of that, figure out which ad to show you in that moment, and then split the revenue with the owner of that website. So massive sites like CNN and Oprah, Livestrong, all the way down to tiny little blogs that you and I have never heard of, but mm. somebody somewhere has said, we get some traffic, we'd like to make some money, Google, put some ads on our site. And yes, there's a fair bit of fraud there. And yes, there are a lot of sites that are designed just to show ads um, so that they can make revenue. But that's a whole different rabbit hole that we could wander down. But yeah, 2 million sites. that And, that, and that's where you're going to see predominantly banner ads. 
but also yeah. the remarketing ads. So, you know, you've just been looking at the Play-Doh Princess Castle. I speak from possibly recent experience. Um, <laughs> and, but you haven't bought it yet. And then as you wander around and you check in the sports scores for the next couple of days, you see the picture of the Play-Doh Princess Castle because that website knows you were very interested in that product, but you haven't bought it yet. So we're going to wander around, follow you around and, and show you ads and try and nudge you into buying. Got it. That makes sense. So normally um, it was just a, a timing thing because I had just hired a team. So I went right to that, but I, I do want to learn more about you and how you got into this. <laughs> that was just a, a selfish. Uh, it's funny for everybody listening. They're like, Hey, we don't know much about this guy, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I, um, how, I guess normally when I start off an interview, I, I ask like, cause I'm just curious, like, how did you actually, like, what were you doing before this? How, what led you to this? I could, I could, yeah, I could step it back bit by bit, or we could start at the beginning. It's entirely up to you. What let's, I was start, doing, let's start at the beginning. So when I was sick, I yeah. wanted to be a pilot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I saw this thing on TV, this guy like leaning out of a helicopter. They were shooting tranquilizer darts or something. I later found out. At the time, I just saw this guy whipping around the mountains in a helicopter, and I went, that, I want to do that. Um, I did actually fly a plane before I drove a car. My mum sent me off to do this this week flying course when I was 16. Thanks, mum. That's cool. I don't think I was ever like super, super serious. It wasn't like I, that was the thing I lived for. I mean, yes, I built models of planes like most kids do. But then I ended up in Hawaii. When I was a uni student, I ended up in Hawaii for a summer. I'm watching all these helicopters fly around. I'm thinking, yeah, why not? Why not now? Why not I finally, you know, realize that dream that I had since I was a kid? So I got the yellow pages, that's how old I am. And I called every helicopter company in Honolulu. I got myself an interview the next day with one of them. And I talked myself into a job. This was early nineties and computers were starting to become a thing. I kind of knew a bit about computers because my dad worked for Xerox. And I said like, I will help you computerize your office, computerize your operations, you know, improve your business. And you don't need to pay me. huh? No, that just teach me how to fly and we'll swap my time for flying time. And they said, yes. So I learned to fly, belting down the canyons of Kuwai and along you know, the, past the volcanoes on Maui. And I learned to fly helicopters. I ended up going back to the UK, that's where I was born and finishing uni. And then I ended up working for the most prestigious helicopter company in Europe. So we had clients mm. like, oh, I don't know, the queen and um, <laughs> it's this guy awesome. and uh, Oh, I don't know, like Bill Gates and Michael Schumacher, um, all these silly boy bands from that time, that era, that'll really date me. But it was fabulous. And I wasn't a pilot at that point. I was in flight operations. So I was arranging all of the flights. But I would talk to the pilots down in the ready room and, and chatting to them. And what I discovered was that every single one of them couldn't wait to retire. I'm like, hmm. how sad is this? They, I mean, they've been in this industry for 15, 20, 25 years, they were terribly poorly paid, really, for the risks they were taking and what they were responsible for. And they couldn't wait to retire. They referred to themselves as drivers. They were basically posh taxi drivers. And I thought, I don't wanna do this for the rest of my life. I, I want aviation to be a hobby. I wanna be the guy sitting in the back of the helicopter like him, drinking champagne and getting flown around. That looks way more fun. So I decided not to spend the rest of my life in aviation and kind of, I always knew at the back of my mind that I would have my own business. I had never had any like strong, like this is what it's going to be. I guess I was always a bit entrepreneurial, but I didn't know for sure. And then I left the UK about that time, uh, went to New Zealand for three weeks, stayed for three years, like you do on my way to Australia. And I ended up starting my first business there. That was a success. I built that up, sold it and moved to Sydney uh, within 18 months of starting that business. And it was all down to one book or two books, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber and mm -hmm. The Cashflow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. The Cashflow Quadrant was the why and the E-Myth was the how, how to systemize things. I landed in Sydney and bumped into this E-Myth consultant. I was like, there are consultants, there are people that can help you do this. I just read the book. <laughs> and I ended up writing to Gerber and there is, I will get there eventually. I promise you. We're almost oh, there. no, no. I'm all in, man. I love this stuff. <laughs> so you're good. 
I'm in it. Well, um, so I wrote to Gerber, and this was a month after 9 11, and he called me back, and I was freaking out like, oh my God, I've got Michael Gerber's PA on the phone, and apparently Michael wants to talk to me. He said, well, four times a year, we invite people to California to come train with us and become EMIT consultants. I went, that sounds awesome. When is it? He says, the next one's on Tuesday. This was Friday. <laughs> so I dropped everything, which wasn't much to drop at that point because I thought I was semi-retired. I was wrong. Um, and I flew to the California um, a month after 9-11, very empty plane. Um, or if you remember that time, like, you know, American flags everywhere. It was, I'd been to the States a few times before that, but that was a different experience and trained with Gerber and his team and became an EMIT consultant. And I would rock up, you know, fresh faced. I've built one business and sold one business. Woohoo! And I'd walk into these businesses going, I'm going to help you systemize your business. And they'd all go, mate, I just want more customers. I'm like, yeah, 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 we've got that. That's module five of the seven modules. Ding, you know, we're, we're going to do this. And they were like, well, <laughs> I just want module five. I'm like, no, 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 see, it's Gerber. It's a system. We have to do all seven modules. Okay, well, when do we get to module five? Is that like day five, week five? Oh, usually month 10. Mate, get out. And I sucked. Yeah. I absolutely sucked at being an EMIT consultant because everybody wanted more customers and I was supposed to teach them mindset and systemizing and getting the right team. And I realized now, being older, how smart Gerber was to do it that way. Because if you double the leads in most businesses, a lot's going to break. And so Definitely. this was all about getting them ready for that and, and changing the mindset and building the foundation of the business. But back then, I didn't know that. I was just like, yeah, we can't just jump to module five. Duh, sorry. So I would get kicked out of all these offices. And not long after I sucked at that, I saw this guy, Perry Marshall, who's now my co-author on the book, yep. giving this presentation about Google Ads. And it was brand spanking new back then. This is middle of 2004, Perry's first time in Australia. And here he was talking about this, this tool, this platform. Well, hang on a minute. You, you, you only show ads to people that are searching for the stuff that you sell. And you only pay if they're interested enough to click on that little ad and come to your website. Oh, my God. Like, all these people I'd been talking to, they were doing letterbox drops and radio ads and yellow pages ads. This was, wow, this, this God, sounds amazing. Now, I, I certainly wasn't smart enough back then to go, when these guys float, buy loads of their shares and just sit on that for the next 15 years. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, omnipotent, but I wasn't. But I did come back to my mastermind and I was telling everybody that would listen about this thing. One of my mates said, I don't want you to consult to me. And he gave me half of his business to come in and do Google ads. And we sold a hundred grand worth of stuff in three and a half weeks. And I went, this stuff really works, okay. And I would just try and teach everybody that wanted to know, or a lot of people that didn't want to know about this thing. I've always loved the business of business. I've always loved just trying to grow businesses. And here was this magical tool that did just that. But for every 10 people that I spoke to, nine would say, mate, I don't care how it bloody works, just do it for me. And so I'd start you know, swapping it for cases of beer and a bit of cash here and there. And eventually I thought, oh, okay, we could probably build a business out of this. And I started the agency and that's what we've been doing ever since. And now we've got a team of geniuses down the end of the room there uh, doing this stuff for clients all over the world. And we grow businesses. It's, it's what I've always loved doing. It's what I did way back in the day with that helicopter business of like, let's systemize and grow and put repeatable processes in place to help you get more customers, more clients, more patients, whatever it is, that's, that's what Google Ads does. It's best, best analogy I've ever heard is not mine. Um, it's from this guy, Dean Jackson, for me, one of the best marketers on the planet. And he compares your marketing to being a vending machine rather than a slot machine. For most businesses, their marketing is a slot machine. You know, put your money in, mm. pull the handle and hope for the best. For the vending machine, you know exactly what you're gonna get. You put your dollar in, you press the button and the Diet Coke falls out or the $5 note in this case falls out or the $10 note or the $20 note. Depends how you've set up the machine. Mm -hmm. That is a Google ads account done well. You put a dollar in, you press the button and 10 bucks falls out. So how often do you want to play that game? All, all day. day. <laughs> yeah, all day. <laughs>
<laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, we we actually we had Perry on the show uh, a couple months ago. Um, awesome. So so yeah, no Perry and um, uh, what was it? oh this is what I wanted to ask. So I I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk fan and I've heard him talk about Google Ads uh, with wine. Like uh, I'm assuming maybe similar timing when it because I think he said when it first came out it was just like the pricing was just so ridiculous oh, yeah. uh, in in a good way. I mean, and um, so from you said 2004 2000 yeah. is that when it the platform really first came out 2002. around it 2002 started. okay um, but when it first started they thought they were selling to to big companies you know your toyotas and cokes and nikes it was all through ad reps so adwords as we know it started really around 2003 so yeah we were i must have been one of the first people in australia to actually use it and, and go sell a hundred grand's worth of stuff in three weeks. And that's you know, sick. yeah, it, it, was, it was all five cent clicks back then. It was, it was, it was hard to mess it up and it was yeah. so simpler. I've compared it being, you know, a occasional pilot. I've compared it back then to like flying a small plane, which is like a car that also goes up and down. If you can drive, you can fly a Cessna. It's dead easy. These mm. days, it's like a 747 cockpit. You know, there's buttons and bells and whistles everywhere. And if you get one of those things wrong, you're going to hurt a lot of people. It's mm -hmm. so much more complicated now. I'm, I'm very glad I learned it when I did because learning that next little bit, that next bit of nuance is so much easier when you've sort of started simple and it's slowly over time become more complicated. Diving in and learning it from scratch today would be a pretty daunting process, I'd imagine. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you is is like the main differences that you've seen from the start to now. But I guess it's just like everything, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, basically everything. I mean, yeah. I guess the big huge difference would be machine learning. When Google started, there was no machine learning involved. You know, they didn't get into machine learning until about 2011, as I understand it. This The, the smartest bloke you've never met uh, mm -hmm. introduced machine learning to Google, this guy, Andrew Ng, who since you know, built the machine learning department at Google, went on to Baidu, uh, then founded Coursera, this little company you might've heard of that's about to float, um, yeah. and a whole bunch of other AI companies, absolute genius. But he had to fight back in the day to, to get machine learning introduced at Google. They had to do these little projects and prove how good it was. Do you remember Google Translate? I uh, it, you'd write something in English, you'd translate it to yeah. Italian. You get the Italian, you paste that back in and translate it back into English. And it was absolute gibberish most of the time. <laughs> the, 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 the step change with that thing was machine learning. And that's when they all went, oh, this is kind of, yeah, okay, kind of use Google itself. Like the page of search results that you see when you search Google, that used to be run by a whole bunch of rules. If this, then that. So mm -hmm. you know, if I'm searching for the saints, well, I'm going to see a very different result if I'm in Italy compared to if I'm in New Orleans and I'm searching for the Saints, right? So there's, there's a rule based on location. If they're in New Orleans, they're probably looking for the football team. So show these results. If they're somewhere else in the world, they're probably looking for people with halos. All right. um, ah, okay. That makes right? sense. They were up to 4 million of these rules, all hand-coded by the geeks in Google and they were realizing that they had a problem. These rules were starting to interfere with each other. We all started using these little things and we were searching in different ways. They knew that voice was gonna become a thing, but 15% of the search terms they see every day, they've never seen before. How do you write a rule for a search term that no one's ever used before? If lots of people are searching for the saints, then you can write a rule for that. But then somebody pops up and asks this question of Google that's never been asked before, how do you write a rule for that? And that's where they realized that machine learning was the future to be able to serve those results and make them really, really good in the time available. I mean, what is it now? Like 50,000 searches a second or something on Google? Yeah. Uh, a chunk of those it's never seen before. And we're all using it in weird, wonderful ways. And that's the genius of the system is that it's sort of getting better and better all the time. And the proof's in the pudding. I mean, like, look at the market share of... Um, of Bing or bless them, Yahoo, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's basically gone now. Google is basically 95% of search in the world, at least outside of China. It, it's, they've done a very good job of that. <laughs> yeah, it is just to even think about that is so crazy to me. So like Google 
starts out at so you said there's four million rules uh, written by humans so they have it and then yeah i don't know it's just actually over my head i don't even know what to say about that <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's just acknowledge it <laughs> um so one of uh, one of the questions um that i was uh, looking at and i i think now's a good time to like go deeper down the machine learning ai rabbit hole um so uh, can AI have a consciousness? This is this is one of the questions. So I'm curious. I want to know this, and then I'm sure this will take us on a wild journey. Sure. Well, I was asked this question recently by an 11 year old. Oh, okay, so, cool. <laughs> during lockdown, I um, I had this. I've, I've been really interested in AI, machine learning. I am not an AI engineer. I have bugger all qualifications other than the the Google course and the Coursera course but I'm fascinated by it. And I want to be able to think a little bit more like a Google engineer so I can see or start to see where they're going with AI. Like, why is it behaving like this? The more I understand it, the figure, I figure the better marketer it will make me. For sure. And so during lockdown, I basically put together this course. I got asked by a friend of a friend who's a primary school teacher, hey, would you do um, a Zoom call to my class of 11 year olds about AI and machine learning? Um, I've heard about a talk that you did last year. Sounds awesome. Could you do that for 11 year olds? Would they, would they get it? I'm like, hell yeah. I love education. It's a massive sort of passion of mine. So I said, yes. And then he knew a whole bunch of other teachers. And now I started getting emails from all over Australia saying like, would you do your AI talk to my 11 year olds? So I did a whole bunch of these during lockdown last year. And that was one of the questions that came up. And I'm like, the first the first call I did, they asked that question. I'm like, what, what, did, what, what conversations oh, yeah. did you have with your parents at night? Oh my goodness. Like, yeah, I was just going to say that I didn't even acknowledge it fully. It didn't register, but now it's fully registering. The fact that an 11 year old even used the word consciousness, in my opinion, is pretty profound. So yeah. that's cool. <laughs> Kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. So yeah. with that said, I have thought about this a little, but I don't have a good answer. Um, what is consciousness? What, what defines that? I don't think, I think the, the various engineers, the ethicists, the theologians, the, all the people way smarter than us, frankly, are all mm -hmm. still debating that of what would that actually mean? Does that mean that a computer can actually feel, but then what is a feeling, right? And I guess the way I'm gonna to choose to answer that is if they are so good at faking it, so we can maybe talk about GPT-3 and, and machines writing the written word. But if they're so good at faking it that you can't tell the difference, then does it matter if they do or don't have a conscience at this point? If you can't tell the difference, mm. does it matter if they actually do or actually don't? Because it's going to appear to everybody that they do. I don't know, that starts to blow my mind and I haven't had near enough red wine because it's seven o'clock in the morning. To think about <laughs> the right yeah. But yeah, For sure. It, it, so let's, let's take the writing one. Like, you know, are machines intelligent? Let's maybe start there. It's like easing into the consciousness thing. Mm -hmm. Well, if they are able to put words together on the page in such a way that it certainly appears like they're intelligent, and we can't tell the difference, which is kind of, you know, the Turing test, Alan Turing from 1955. Can that machine basically trick you into you believing that it's human because its answers are so good? Then does it matter really if it's a human or a machine? I don't know. That's the philosophy around that does my head in. I was never trained in that sort of stuff at, at university. I was always like the maths and the stats and the engineering stuff. Yeah. So, it, it kind of hurts my brain, frankly, to think about all of that. I don't, I don't yeah. think so in the sense that we think of consciousness like as a living, breathing human that hurts and feels, that has empathy. But again, I think we will create machines that are a very close facsimile of that, that, that appear to have all of those traits, at which point, yeah, does it really matter? I mean, like the way people talk to their Google assistants and their Alexas, shush. Um, <laughs> we, we tend to talk down to robots. There's a bunch of studies on this and it's really quite sad about the way we 
treat robots. And there's actually a difference if you have a male voice or a female voice on your Siri, Google, whatever. Really? Talk to them differently. I've turned on this. There's actually a feature on the Google Assistant. So my house is full of them, sadly, or good in a way. But there's a feature there where you kind of get rewarded for being polite. So if you say thank you at the end of a thing, it says something like, hey, no problem. So I've turned that on on all of our devices and make a point of saying thank you so that my kids, who are still quite young, um, hear me talking to the, the robot, the computer. They think Google's a woman, you know, to them. Mm -hmm. They've grown up with her being, you know, in this little device in the house. My younger daughter was two and a half when I got my first Google Home. And yeah, she watched her older sister for a few days. I went, mm, okay. And we could barely understand Frankie at that point when she was two and a half. She, you know, wasn't like super clear when she was talking. And she walks up to this device and says, hey, Google, I can't do it because everything will light up already. Hey, Google, play Frozen, which was, you know, like the thing she wanted to listen to all the time. And it did. And it was like, that was my moment. 2016 where I went oh my goodness this is going to change the world if you can understand my two and a half year old who is not speaking that clearly and figure out what she said what she meant by that and then do it this is way years before she learned to, to, to write or type and yet she could now control this thing you should see her eyes light up at that point yeah, she can control this thing and play music on this thing and play music that her sister doesn't want to listen to, but that she does. Ha! Oh, that's a win. I don't know how I ended up on that rabbit hole, but no, um, no, it's it's so interesting because, well, I always think too. Like I'm, I'm just grateful that I was, I was kind of on the cusp, right? So I'm 29. So I, I had my first cell phone in seventh grade, I believe. So like I still remember a time like before I was like like so embodied by all the tech. Right. And I, so I'm grateful for that. But what I think is interesting is like uh, the generation below me, I suppose, like they're just, um, they don't know a life without it, you know? So yeah. um, I don't know. I just wonder from a developmental standpoint, what that looks like um, down the road. That's just a curiosity thing. It would um, be, be interesting to, to see what happens there. I mean, I know there yeah. are schools like Steiner School where you don't touch technology until you're seven. And clearly mm. we didn't do that in our house. But I figure that technology is going it's, to. Everywhere. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, no, I'm with you. <laughs> the sooner they learn to interact with it, to be polite to it, to use it as a tool, I figure the better. I mean, I, I'm one of the reasons I've ended up doing this. I've always been interested in computers and, and the engineering side was because dad would bring computers home from Xerox, get the screwdriver out, and we'd pull the cover off and we'd poke around inside. So I loved mm. the hardware side of things more than the software side of things because it, it made sense to me. Yeah, software, when I was doing like IT tech, which was one of the jobs I had when I was traveling around the world, that was always like, oh, good, there are so many different things that can break. And there are so many different reasons. But hardware was so black and white. It's like you pull this card out, you can see it's burnt and broken. You throw that away, you get a new one, you plug it in and you fix the machine. Like that was always... I pulled my nan's, um, she had a, like a magic mix, like a blender. I pulled that apart when I was like eight years old and put it back together again and it worked. I was like, oh my goodness, I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing, but it works. Like that was a definite, like one of those moments that you go, wow, that's, you know, those sliding door moments where life changes, where you go, this is really cool. I can, I can fix machines. Yeah, um, no, for sure. Have, have you ever heard of Lex Friedman before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great podcast series. Okay. Yeah. 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 I love his stuff. I, I was just going to say, I think you'd love him. He, I was just listening to one of his last episodes and he was saying that he thinks at some point like robots, there's going to be like a movement, like a rights type of movement, right? Where like, because of kind of going off what you were saying, um, which is an interesting study. I was not aware of that, of just the way we speak to robots. So like once they do get to that human full human level, you know, as we're, we're kind of treating them like, Hey, do this, do that. But once they get to that human level, whether it's real or not, they will like emotionally respond. And, you know, there could be some sort of like, you know, treat your robots, right movement or something, you know, and it sounds funny now, but like, he, he was like, yo, it's, it's a real thing. Like, you know, this is going to seriously happen. <laughs> so. and, and, and I mean, 
and there's there's going to be a whole bunch I think before then too because yeah. you know, the money side of things. How do you tax a robot? Who owns the rights? To the robot? Because like if, if so, Hollywood and the news media will keep telling us that like the robots are coming, the machines are going to take depending on which report you read thirty percent. Oh yeah, and you know they're going to take half the jobs. I think it's much more hopeful than that. I don't think they take half the jobs, but they do replace a number of the tasks that we currently do. So we have to basically keep leveling up and we will change the way we work and do things that machines can't do as well as us yet. And we'll move away from the stuff that machines are better at, like maths and just doing that math stuff over and over quickly, like bidding in Google mm -hmm. Ads. But as we keep leveling up, some jobs will be lost some new jobs will be created net net we probably do lose some jobs probably not half but then people are using these machines to do the work there's no income tax being collected on that you know that's like mm. the top end of town is really interested in this rpa robotic process automation if i could replace by 5,000 person workforce with a whole bunch of machines oh my goodness i'd be rolling in money like mr burns <laughs> um, it's the big thing at the top end of town, like replacing yeah. headcount. Google have said to us a few times, hey, look, if you, if you lean into this automation more and more, you'll be able to cut three or four people from your team. I'm like, I don't want to cut three or four people from my team. They're awesome. They're wonderful. They're great at what they do. I want to use the tool to augment what they do to help them level up and do more interesting things, do less grunt work, do less repetitive stuff. But I don't want to use the tool so I can get rid of people, but mm -hmm. some businesses will. And then, yeah, so I mean, jump forward a bit, less people in work, where, does the, where do the taxes come from? There's all these people then that need some sort of welfare help and universal income is one of those things that's been floated. Where does the money come from for that unless we tax the robots in some way or the Good output? point. That's interesting. And that very, that right there might be the test because if you hear a robot complaining about taxes, that's real. <laughs> Can't fake that. <laughs> okay. That's real. So there's the, there's, yeah. Um, so another thing I want to ask you about is, is on the voice side. So um, how do you think like Google home and Alexa and stuff with advertisements, how is that going to, um, kind of start happening without it making it um, not an enjoyable to tool to have, right? So in my mind, it's like, you would be like, hey, Google, order me some toothpaste. And I actually think Gary V said this, so I might be taking this for him, him but yeah. he's like, order some toothpaste. And then they're like, oh, we think you might like Colgate whitening. And that's Colgate actually paying for them to say that or something, or maybe it's worded a little differently because that sounds a little yeah. inauthentic. But do you think it'll be like that? Or like, how will they monetize the voice? Because I think it's coming. You, you're right. I mean, if it's going to be, I think the predictions were a bit off. It was meant to be something like 30% or 50% of searches would be done without a screen by this point. And that doesn't happen. Yeah. We, in our house, we have a bunch of the Google things and we use them for finding out what the weather is and playing music. We, we don't use them for a whole lot of other stuff. Now, I don't have an Alexa because, I don't know, I just somehow trust Bezos less. <laughs> yeah, no, they're definitely listening. I mean, look, they're all, they're all listening. <laughs> it's, it's happening. Oh, Hello. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, they were. Well, so like where Amazon, I think, will go with it and Professor Scott Galloway has talked and thought about this a lot more than I have. So I'm stealing some of his stuff here for sure. But with zero click, you know how they've uh, patented or trademarked one click ordering? Okay. So zero click ordering, where they're going to get to is they're going to send you a box of stuff that might be weekly, monthly, whatever. Here's the stuff that we think you're going to love and need. And just whatever you don't need, send back to us. We'll pay for it. Don't worry about it. Just put it in this thing and send it back because we've got the cars driving, the vans driving around all the time anyway. What? That's crazy. Order. I didn't think but of that. Amazon, though, so you, if you're ordering your toothpaste on this cycle through Amazon, at the point where they start selling everything, I mean, I think something like a third of the batteries sold in the US are Amazon branded batteries now. Mm. You know, they thought that was a super profitable niche. They watch everybody selling on their platform. Then they go, awesome, right, we'll do that. And then they start 
putting their own ads and their own products in front of everybody else's and now they're selling a third of the batteries sold. Crazy. They are doing that in a whole bunch of niches, which is why I've never gone down the whole, you know, create the Amazon store and like, it, it's just totally see it ends well. But yeah. if they could send you a box of stuff and eventually this could be clothes, it could be groceries, it could be books, it could be all sorts of stuff. It could be the latest iPad Pro based on my search behavior, Google and Apple and maybe Amazon know that I'm probably in the market for a new iPad Pro when the new one comes out next month. They might mm. just send that to me going, we're pretty sure you want this. How likely am I at that point to send it back? It's going to like tip me over the edge on a few things that maybe I wouldn't have bought. If they send me new moleskin notebooks every you know few weeks because they see that I tend to order them every five weeks, then they're just going to send me five and say, just keep them. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So at that point, will they need to monetize voice in an annoying way? I don't know. I'm thinking about this for the first time now. Will they need to do that and need to try and jam ads down our throat? Or will they just say, we've, we've compared everything. We think this is the best one for you. And people are lazy when it comes to convenience, right? We'll just say, oh, yeah, go on then. Send me two of those. And oh, yeah, done. 100%. Okay. Yeah, give no. Me, give me tickets to Cirque du Soleil. Oh. Uh, yeah, would you want the really, really fancy ones down the front or do you want the cheap ones at the back? Oh, get me something in the middle. How many do you want? Four, done. Yeah, it'll be, if it can be quick and painless and convenient and easy and they don't try and jam ads down our throat in the middle of that, I suspect they'll do it in a very, they'll do it in a way that makes the money for sure. Yeah. But in a way that isn't annoying. Again, Google are always balancing that between like the stakeholders, the users and the advertisers. They're trying to keep those three groups happy, but they mm. always say that they're focusing on the users first and yet the revenue keeps going up and up and up. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, to me, I think the reason for that kind of delay is um, for a lot of purchases. Now, maybe not the tickets like you were talking about. Like, I think that yeah. works perfectly, but for a lot of other things, like visual is just such a, a, a you know, like a lot of times when you make a purchase, you want to see it, right? So if it's just voice, you can't see it. So kind of like, um, it's probably already possible. It probably already exists, but like in movies, when you see the, like the tech movies and they'll like plop a computer screen, but it's like just a, um, hylogrific or something, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's just a projector. Yeah. So yeah. if like the Google home, if you could tap on top of it and that came up, so you, then I think voice would be used a lot more because mm -hmm. then you can, because even with an eye, like I'd still want to like kind of compare diff, maybe like different ones. Like, oh, there's a new one. So, so maybe they'll either send us four similar but different ones and say, look, yep, yep. sounds good. I kind of know what you want based on what you've ordered before. I reckon these three or these four, I've sent all four to you. Just send the three back that you don't want. Yep. That's good for the planet. There's going to be a whole bunch of returns flying around. There are at the moment certainly like fast batch when people order five and then send four back. The, yeah. Oh, well, that's the Amazon wardrobe thing. Do you know about that? Like uh, there's a thing on Amazon. So when I first heard it, cause I hate shopping, I was like, I was like kind of into it. I was like, so you basically order like as many clothes as you want or up to seven pieces of clothes from Amazon. And then they come to you, it's called Amazon wardrobe. And then you try what you, and then you send back. Now here's the thing that happened with me. I'm too lazy to send it back. Like so it doesn't work for me. And I, so I tried it once. I didn't like half the stuff, but I just kept it. Cause I was like, what am I going to do? Like actually take the time to package this thing up, go to FedEx or whatever, and like do all that. I was like, no. So I just kept it. So uh, maybe for others that, you know, they did it, but um, uh, that's the one thing with that. Now, if they make sending it back really easy, like, or, you know, yeah, just immediate service that, that if yeah. they you have to take it to the FedEx depot, there'll be somebody else that pops up like a, a an Uber driver on his day off that goes around and collects all the packages from people yes. taking them out of FedEx and charges you a bit for that. Like yeah. somebody will come in to fill the gap. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Or like Peter, Peter Diamandis, right, author of Bold and Abundance has talked about this, that maybe we'll get to the point where your AI will talk to their AI. So if, if we give permission to an AI, let's just say, you know, and I'm, I think where he's coming from is, if you've seen The Circle, Tom Hanks movie. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Camera that basically is watching and listening the entire time. 
if we gave permission to an AI to do that, because there was so much convenience by doing that, you know, like a week from now, where I'm trying to remember that thing that I said to Tyler and what was the thing? And it just popped up and said, you said, blah, 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 blah. Oh, thanks. That's super convenient. Or, you know, you're in the pub talking to your mates and like, yeah. Who oh yeah. That would be helpful. <laughs> and it would just pop up and say that because yeah. I know where Google Glass was going, but way before it's time. Like if my AI sees everything that I see and everything that I do and type, and it would know that I want the iPad Pro, not the iPad mini, and certainly not the HP laptop. It, it would know my preferences and it would understand the context. And, and we're way, way, way away from this, right? Because Siri can't even bloody understand me when I ask for directions. Yeah. To my house. It's just, what? I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Um, <laughs> oh, it's so much worse than Google Assistant. It's, it's <laughs> the only reason I might get a Pixel phone is to get away from Siri. Oh, I'm wow. So in, so That's plugged great. into the Apple ecosystem that I just I can't escape at this point. <laughs> yeah, just Apple shares went up so much last year. Where was I going? Um, <laughs> no, we're um, actually wait. We went down a couple different. <laughs> AI, right. So then, yeah, the thing would come out, and my AI, my AI would have a chat with their AI, and it would figure out which thing I I was most interested in, and it won't need to send me four it will know my preferences and the context I'm going to use it. And it will send me the one that when I get, I go, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. How did I not know about this? But what happens to ads at that point? Why do you need to see an ad for something? If your AI can talk to other AI, and again, I think we are a long way away from that, but the way Peter Diamandis talks about it, it's like, it's, it's a certainty and it's just around the corner. Yeah. I think it might be a little bit further away than that, but it's an interesting thought experiment. I think that is really interesting because when I saw that movie, like two things ran through my head. One was, okay, if, if everybody had that, then there would, you know, there'd be less crime, I would imagine, because, you know, you're not, unless you're like really crazy, you're not going to like rob somebody while you know that they are recording you and you're recording the robbing. <laughs> so, so there's a positive. The, the con though, obviously is the privacy. And I think that's like a, in human nature, like we, you know, obviously do like to have our privacy, not necessarily to do bad things. It's just like, because you like privacy, I, you don't want yeah. everybody watching everything you do. Yeah. So the state can see, I mean, because yeah, we're... that's what I'm not in for. I don't really like that. <laughs> a country that exists a bit like that today, where everything is seen, everything is filmed. And it's just, it's just too much power in the hands of too few at that point. And yeah not a democracy anymore and ultimately somebody's going to use that for bad everybody says they won't totally you know, ultimately like having that much power is going to corrupt some people but yeah i think it's inevitable because that's the thing it's like if you could have it because i actually thought where you were going and that's why i laughed when you were talking about the pub because i was thinking um and i i don't really drink much anymore but when i did um you know waking up and forgetting so then, then you could just go to your AI and be like, yo, I have no idea what I said to this person. Can you like, let me know? <laughs> um, that would be convenient. Um, and, and incredibly embarrassing too. This yeah. Time. Yeah. I'm very glad I can't remember what I did. <laughs> or maybe like AI is so smart. It like, it like knows it's like, Hey, do you like Tyler? Good morning. Do you want to see the top three things that you like screwed up on last night? <laughs> and I'd be like, ah, I'm not really in the mood to work on myself today. Maybe on Monday. <laughs> Appreciate you that. Um, no, that's awesome. So um, yeah, look, I, I, I we could, uh, I love going down these rabbit holes, but um, I want to leave the floor to you. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like to touch on? And then also uh, let people know where they can connect with you, website, book, you know, everything, social media. I, I think, uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's, we've covered a lot of ground, some interesting tangents. Yeah. I'm all about the tangents on tangents on tangents. Me too, man. That's why I love podcast. I'm almost thinking like, like for a conversation like this, I'm like, the three hours would have been useful. <laughs> so, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it very good. Um, yeah. So if, if someone wants to get in touch, let's, let's come, I'll bring it back around to the Google ads. If, if you want to learn, cause if you've made it this far in, you must have some interest in, in Google ads. So I've got this whole course on Google ads that I put up for free. If you go to so it's my Google ads fundamentals course, so G A F 
course.com. And whether you like videos, whether you like podcasts and just listening to the audio, whether you like the written word, we've got like super like, I don't know, there's 10,000 word posts. You can get it as a PDF. You can get 39 individual videos. It's all free. If you want to learn the basics of Google Ads, it will not turn you into someone that, that can start managing 10 grand a month accounts, but you'll learn the basics in a lot more detail than we went into today. So that's gafcourse.com. That's probably a great place to start. If you're running Google Ads and you would like a second pair of eyes looking over your account, you're spending at least 10 grand a month, then we might be able to help. Um, in which case, just find me at websavvy.com.au and uh, get in touch. Ask a question. I love the business of business. So if you want to even just ask a question about how to grow your business, hit me up, find me, and um, I'll do my best to answer it the best I can. Perfect, man. Thanks for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, so did I, man. Absolute pleasure.